this panel, I'm going to be talking about access at scale. Um, to my left here, we have Joe and Chris from Jump. Um, we've, I've worked with the Jump Trading and the crew for a few years, and it's uh, obviously post-COVID, it's great to <laughs> be in person and discuss some of their um, items about access at, accessing infrastructure at scale. And before we sort of dive too deep into things, um, Joe, you want to give a quick introduction? Yeah, sure. Um, so my name is Joe Conti. Um, I've been with Jump Trading for a little over nine years. Um, prior to that, I worked for Barclays, um, and part of that, I worked for Lehman Brothers. Um, my uh, beginning experience with finance was Lehman. Um, I joined Lehman about uh, a year before the bankruptcy, uh, so that's always fun. Um, and prior to that, um, I did a bunch of small business consulting. Um, I started with Linux in 1993 with Slackware 3.6. Uh, I've been a Linux enthusiast for many, many years. Uh, my name's Chris. I've been with Jump for just over a year, but I've been in finance just like Joe for quite a while, uh, just over 10, 11 years. I uh, did a brief stint in between proprietary trading firms at some place called AWS. It's all right, <laughs> I guess. I don't know. Um, and then prior to that, like actually oil and gas, I'm from Texas. So uh, unlike Joe, I, I've not been a Linux expert my entire life. I actually used to be a Windows engineer. Uh, <laughs> the guy dogging on AD earlier was making me really sad. But um, no, I've just been a systems engineer and a systems leader my whole career. So cool to be up here talking about teleport. Nice. And uh, for people unfamiliar, can you just give a little bit of background about what Jump is? Jump sure. Trading. Sure. So um, Jump Trading is a research-based, uh, world-class uh, research-based trading firm that serves as a market maker, enabling stocks, bonds, and currencies to be bought and sold in an orderly manner in markets worldwide. Um, we often think of ourselves as a technology-first company because um, we are, are often on the bleeding edge of technology. Um, and we were with Teleport as well. And I've been more familiar with Jump from the crypto angle as well. Uh, yes, I mean we've we've been uh, we are a vocal um, player in the crypto markets today. Uh, we haven't always been, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so today's sort of far side chat is about access at scale. Sure. Can you sort of paint some pictures about what scale means at Jump? Sure. So um, you know we're often talking with um, you know many hundreds of users and many thousands of servers um, and working across those large scales, um, we, get, we often find interesting problems, um, you know, one of which is you know, we, if you look at a slice across all of our users, um, we have people that are engineers um, that are accessing uh, servers. Uh, we have people that are quants that are accessing servers. We have you know, someone in purchasing and logistics who you know, barely knows how to use SSH, but they're using that to access the system and, and get some, some data out of that. So um, we have lots of different access patterns um, at Jump. And trying to take that and, and lift that and move that into Teleport from our legacy systems is certainly a challenge. And, and to be clear, I mean, Jump is a consumer of the, of the remote SSH piece of Teleport, right? Sure. We've looked at it for Kubernetes and database and app, but um, when, when we're talking about systems and we're explaining what we've done, it's strictly we, we've replaced SSH with Teleport for interactive yeah. access. And are these systems mainly on-prem or are they cloud? It's a systems? mix. Yeah, it's, we've it's got 99.8% like uh, on-prem. <laughs> we, we've got the need for certain systems to be co-located you know, geographically around the world near electronic exchanges. Um, but then we have a lot of back office systems and things that, you know, kind of handle the traditional business that everyone has. And some of those are virtualized, some of those are physical, some of those are cloud. Yeah. Um, you know, cloud's been kind of, I would say, laggard for a lot of financial firms. So we're, we're still kind of getting into it. But obviously, as you mentioned, like we're in the crypto space and a lot of the crypto stuff happens in the cloud. So that's been a, a huge accelerator for us to get that stuff going. And do you use any, you said you don't use Teleport Kubernetes access, but you use a sort of container orchestration system such as Kubernetes or? Yeah, so uh, we use many different uh, systems to jump. Uh, we like to say that we have, you know, all of the standards and all of the systems because <laughs> uh, we, we do have lots of various things uh, deployed to jump. Um, but yeah, we do, we've, we've been using Kubernetes uh, since about 2016, 2017. Um, and we've built our own um, kind of access pattern uh, for Kubernetes, and, and that works well for us today. Uh, the goal is to eventually move to Teleport, though. That's a day two objective. And so when you're operating a sort of jump scale, you know, we've gone a long way from the pets to cattle, and 
be very large fleets. And I guess when you have many thousands of cattle, interesting things can happen. Um, can you tell me about some interesting things that you see operating at the scale that you do? Yeah, sure. I mean, we, we see um, there's lots of interesting things. Um, yeah, I think one of the more uh, recent things in memory that, that was uh, fascinating is, you know, as you're deploying, you know, uh, many, many servers and you've got, you know, many, many thousands of CPUs, um, we had one particular server where a particular workload ran on it and it would fail um, every once in a while. Um, and it ended up being a specific core on that specific system and it ended up being a bad CPU. Um, so that, that's one interesting problem. But like tracing that across our, our massively parallel workload is really tough to do. Um, so we've built tools around that to, to try and enable us to fix these problems at scale. Um, I know, Chris, you've got some other but, things. I mean, to talk but about. extending that to, to teleport, like yeah. the simplicity of, of onboarding a node with teleport allows us to treat those systems like cattle. Yep. Um, I, I think for us, the, our user community are the pets, right? Like they all have different access patterns. They all they might take offense to that. Don't think that's the wrong <laughs> way. Good call. Um, uh. No, no, no. I mean, only on Halloween they dress up. But um, no, the the uniqueness because we we support multiple trading teams inside of one big trading firm, and a lot of them have grown organically over decades, and you end up with really weird access patterns and. Um, so it's nice for us that we can kind of set it and forget it on the server side. Uh, occasionally, we run into some interesting scaling challenges, but I'm sure we'll talk about those at some point yep. while we're up here. <laughs> um, great. So I think that kind of is a good segue in um, another aspect of managing you know, thousands of servers, or however many you have, is also managing a development team. And according to LinkedIn, tools, it says you have 400 engineers at Jump. I don't know if sure. that's true or not. <laughs> Let's take I, that number. I think every employee at Jump thinks they're an engineer in yeah. some way, <laughs> shape, or form. Um, but I can just say that we've, we've doubled in size um, over the past few years. Um, you know, so we have, we have lots of users um, of Teleport uh, at Jump and lots of different unique use cases, right? So um, to Chris's point earlier, where we've got lots of you know, trading teams, some of them have been with Jump for, for many, many years since inception, some of them are new. They all seem to have different patterns. And, and I think as we've gone through this migration to Teleport, um, it, it's been really interesting to see all of these different patterns and, and things that, you know, as you kind of go and gather requirements before you, you know, execute a massive project like this, um, you know, all of these things are missed because people just assume things like this would work, right? Like SFTP, X11, things that are native to SSH um, that have worked for, for ages, you know, as you kind of lift that and move that to teleport, some things just break. Um, and it's been an interesting discovery. And, and because they're not engineers uh, by trade, like, so, I mean, they're, they're, we obviously do have software devs and, uh, you know, infrastructure engineers and people, but we have a lot of like quants, like people yeah. that come in with a PhD in physics, um, scientific background, and they just expect things to work like it did at Rockefeller or like it did at Berkeley or wherever they came from. And it's like, yeah, I guess we can make that work. And you know, we, we have to kind of shoehorn things in uh, to fit the access patterns that they're used to. They're not all just you know, Jupyter notebooks and everybody runs the same access pattern. It's very, very different. Some of these people frighteningly know as much about SSH or more than, than we do at times, where they're like, oh, yeah. here's my bash RC file. And I'm like, oh my God, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> Does that even work? <laughs> or you know, they'll come to you with a problem and they'll give you like this snippet of open SSH code path that they've, yeah. that they've <laughs> been used to for so many years. Like, why is this not behaving like this? Yep. Um, and is that mainly people who come from like um, high performance computing, like HPC space? Yeah, we, we do have a few of those. Um, yeah, it's 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 certainly interesting, um, you know, to, to watch, you know, them kind of complete the journey to teleport because they have such niche use cases and they've used OpenSH for you know 20, 30 years. Um, so it's it's always it's fascinating to watch to watch the this this pattern that emerges. Um, and each team is different, and each person within that team is different. So there are so many different use cases um, as, as you're kind of going through this migration path. And then what's your philosophy as sort of production engineering team to give your uh, people access to infrastructure? Step one is assign the ticket to me. <laughs> uh, it's, that is a, is a loaded question. Um, so yeah, it, it's really tough, um, frankly, because uh, we have 
I mean, even outside the HPC use case, um, we have lots of developers, um, we have lots of engineers, and they all have very prescribed access. Um, and oftentimes they'll want to, you know, so they'll, they'll be, you know, in their normal bucket of access. Um, and then you'll often get a ticket like, I need access to this one server here, because that one server has a new FPGA in it or a new ASIC in it. Um, and it, managing that type of access um, at scale with Teleport is a bit difficult. It's a challenge. It's, it's something that we is evolving every day that we're, you know, we're tr trying to learn that. And what we find most of the time is that we don't really want just our back. We want our back plus a back or our back plus some, you know, some other type of, um, you know, access control mechanism. But I think one of the ways that we've we've gotten to the bottom of things, like some, there are a lot of days that I joke that like we're like Scooby Doo and the gang trying to figure out like what's the big mystery behind this trading team's problem today and. Uh, We've, we've taken some of the, the, the groups that have struggled a bit with onboarding and put them into Slack rooms. Like, so we've got Slack channels with these folks. Where we've got several people on the product engineering side where we can give a little extra like kind of white glove treatment to get them on. And then what we found is you know, across the large number of employees that we have, like all of a sudden we get internal advocates. So you have someone that's well respected within you know, the quant community, the trader community, the dev community. And they're talking about, oh, well, you just need to do this in your config file, or, oh, let me show you how to get this to work with that Python script. And then now I've got a, a, an advocate you know, sitting in with that team day in and day out that is very familiar with what we're doing with Teleport. So it's, it's been fun to see that transformation. Yeah, and I think to, to expand on that, you know, one of the things that we did was we created a, a public, because um, we have lots of private. Um, way too many. Yeah, we have way too many private channels in Slack. <laughs> uh, we're doing Slack wrong. but. Um, we have we create a public channel for teleport specifically uh, with the goal of you know achieving this users helping users um, you know community um, and I think just the other day we had you know one of our, our first examples or hopefully the first of many where uh, one user helped another user with a similar problem that they had um, you know over over, over time well because as you can imagine we were both on a plane coming here yeah. <laughs> so no one was responding in the teleport help channel like, oh. yeah. they figured it out themselves yeah it was great yeah. and um, what kind of system do you use for source of identity? Do you have a SSO provider or something else in which? Yeah, so we're using OIDC um, right now. Um, and you know, that's been an interesting um, path. One of, the, one of the reasons why I'm saying that is because we deploy many proxies uh, globally uh, for latency reasons. Uh, we want to provide our you know, users the lowest latency to their proxy for obvious reasons. Um, and one of the things that, that uh, wasn't being handled particularly well was the redirect URL in OIDC. So if anyone's familiar with you know, OIDC, you need, you need a static uh, redirect URL. And um, Teleport didn't really handle that too well. Um, it does now. Um, there's a feature that you know, we kind of championed for that, uh, that exists today. But we're actually using some GOIP-based you know, redirect effectively to point people at the right you know, geographically close proxy. Um, and we, we found that there's, there's an upcoming chat about misusing Teleport. We have misused Teleport since day one. There are lots of things that we do that, that are, are non-standard. Um, like most people probably put a bunch of their proxies behind a you know, single um, you know, FQDN. Uh, we have many you know, globally distributed proxies, and they're all kind of unique. But we've also gotten to drive a lot of the, the roadmap for Teleport, which has been fun. Sure. Like we've partnered with you guys on so many different uh, just you know, feature enhancements and things because we've been hammering at this thing from 14 different directions. Yeah, yeah. And how is that different working with a sort of open core company for your other vendors? It, I, I think it's uh, you know beneficial, frankly, because you know what, some of the things that we are doing. Um, you know, I, I watch the GitHub issues um, pretty religiously, and I, I see lots of people using features that we've you know come to you guys and said you know, hey, we really need this. X11 being one of them. Um, you know. It's one of those things where you know we knew there's some X11 usage, uh, you know, uh, internally, and as we've kind of you know started this migration path, um, we were surprised to see how much X11 usage is, is happening around the firm. And in 2022, yeah, in 2022, and it's, and it's mostly <laughs> HPC, right? Um, I mean, can you describe to the audience who aren't aware of what X11 is? Yeah, so it's um, it's using SSH as a tunnel for um, uh, graphical applications. So there'll be an X server running on a local, um, you know, uh, endpoint, uh, whether that's a desktop, laptop, whatever. Um, the X server could be Xming for Windows, X ports for Mac, or um, uh, there's a bunch of them for Windows. Um, I won't list them all, um, you know, or obviously X11, uh, X org, 
um, for Linux. Um, but then that is basically you run an application you know, on the remote end, um, and you're presented with a local um, display of that application. And sometimes these are data engineering applications yeah. where people are doing data mining. But sometimes like there was this one team where they're like, no, we use XClip. I'm like, what? They're like, it's a clipboard in X. And I'm like, why don't you just copy paste out of the terminal? And they're like, we use XClip. And I'm like, OK. <laughs> Yeah, we actually have a weather service in Europe that uses it with X11 as well. So oh, yeah. another high performance computing use case. Yeah, we're familiar with them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then going back to the, you see OIDC, you have groups, you have teams. Do you have any other attributes that you sort of categorize sort of teammates that you bring externally from your identity provider? I mean, the, the main thing from our identity provider that we're just using groups. Uh, I mean, occasionally there's, We've, we've explored some more creative <laughs> options, um, but one of the things that's been nice is we've been able to, so far, despite sometimes cursing and other interesting words tossed around, we've been able to solve pretty much all of the access requests with some combination of labels and groups in our bag, um, which speaks a lot you know, to, to the flexibility there. Um, so yeah, I mean, on, on a claim side, the, the the only gotcha there is, you know, there's that race condition where it's like, oh, well, I got added to this group and I still can't log into the server. And it's like, well, because your cert is encoded with your roles from five well, hours ago. Out, yeah. yeah, don't yeah. forget to pull a new cert. But no. yeah, no, otherwise, like it's, I mean, it's been okay. It's been okay. Um, How uh, has access requests sort of changed your access philosophy? Talking about like just-in-time access or principal least privilege. Well, so, yeah, so just in time access is, is, is going to solve a lot of our problems, frankly, because, you know, going back to that, that point I made earlier, you know, we don't, we, we have these, you know, well prescribed buckets for access. Um, then we have, you know, some buckets that work well with access requests, native access requests. Um, but resource requests, um, I think, as, as was originally known, or just in time access as it's known now. Um, solves a lot of those problems for us because we can say, you know, um, this particular set of developers can access any of these servers with this label, um, and we can even go so far as to auto-approve some of those, right, if we want to build our own plugins, um, you know, which we're going to do. Um, but frankly, I mean, it, it just, it takes us out of the decision-making process, and we can kind of encode a lot of, uh, we can basically describe all of our policy um, and, you know, handle that, whether that's, you know, approval via Slack bot um, or, you know, auto-approval, depending on a certain set of metadata or criteria. But the other approach we've taken to that, though, is to, on the, on the internal side with those groups, right, the, the security groups, we've given... As many times as we can, we've given the uh, the owning team the ability to add and remove users. So as long as the teleport role is built, we can kind of step away. We find ourselves more involved when it's like the teleport role doesn't scope quite enough for what they're trying to do. Right. And, and I mean, to add to that, labels only really take us so far, even, even dynamic labels, right? Um, I, I think, you know, one of the things we're really excited about is predicate and where that's going. Um, you know, we've, we've talked um, quite a bit about building our own DSL and, and kind of, you know, layering that on top of teleport, but we very much want, you know, our vision of what this should look like to be a first class feature in teleports so that everyone can use it. And it also helps us for supportability over time, right? We don't want to build something that is subject to the teleport API changing over time. I like writing YAML. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, there's lots of Kubernetes inspired things. Yeah, that's yes. one of them. Yep. yep. And Predicate will there be a session uh, later today about that. Yep. Oh, nice. So, um, yes. Policy as code project from Teleport. Yep. Um, so as you were sort of operating these sort of like large systems, what what have you found that works really well for you? So I mean, one of the things that. I can't take credit for it because Joe did it. But like uh, one of the things that I would recommend to anyone else trying to do this at scale is put your R back into some sort of repo, right? Whether you're using Terraform, whether you're using um, you know in-house code, whether you're just logging into a box and running TCTL manually. Please don't do that. But um, <laughs> if whatever your access pattern is, the the truth should be. Well, it should, the running truth should be your auth environment, but the like written truth should be in a repo somewhere. And so, like all well the protected. all the ammo for all the roles. I mean, we have tens of roles. Are we at triple digits? We're getting there. We have tens of roles. We'll just say that um, that we've created, and you have to map all those back. And um, when 
you know, we, we have a, a review process that we go through. We have some automated checks that we go through. And then we push that in with some scripts uh, to commit to teleport and like we pull that in. So we don't. We are actually have nothing pushing to auth right, for right, obvious reasons. True. No, it's pulled. so everything is done with pulls from auth to our source from it, our sources of truth. It's a webhook. Yeah, that, yeah. Then yeah. So um, and that saved us so many times because like when you've got multiple operators going in and trying to solve a problem, like I, the uh, the the gentleman from DoorDash was talking about doing it in the GUI, and I almost like fell out of the chair. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I'd... yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, and, and to add to that, I mean, you know, it helps you from like a disaster recovery perspective. I mean, we've, we've run into a couple of gnarly etcd bugs, um, some of which were Teleport's fault, some of which were not. Um, and we had to restore an etcd snapshot from months ago because we hadn't realized that silently under the covers all of our etcd snapshots were corrupted. Um, so we restored like a three month old backup and all of our state was, you know, uh, essentially in our IDM provider and, and, um, you know, encoded in, in Git. Um, so we were able to just, you know, restore that snapshot. Um, you know, we had some interesting errors for a small period of time, but we just quickly, um, roll that back, um, to that state and, and at that moment effectively. Yep. So this is a good segue to my next question, sure. which is what are some of the other rough edges <laughs> that you've experienced with teleport or rolling out teleport? I think one of the biggest challenges for us is the, you know, because we have users all around the globe, um, you know, Asia Pacific, Europe, here, and they're accessing resources all over the globe. We've we've tried to deploy proxies and things, and it it starts to take you. And these are largely on-premise machines, so it, it takes you out of some of the access patterns that I think Teleport was written for. Um, you know, some of the cloud native things that you can do with application load balancing and, and auto scaling groups don't work when there's a machine in Tokyo and there's, you know, a machine in South America or something like that's just, so finding solutions to those things has been a challenge, I think, for us. And, and I think we're still learning and we're still yeah, figuring things out sure. there. Um, yeah, and I, I think, you know, one of the other big rough edges that we've had is, is trying to take our existing policy and, and you know, I, when we first started this journey, it was like, it's like lofty aspirations of like, sure, everything, we'll, we're just gonna review everything we have, we're gonna take it, we're gonna cut it all into nice, neatly defined roles, and, and that's all we'll ever need. Um, and the reality of it is that that's never the case. Um, I think, you know, I spoke earlier about, you know, uh, reducing silos and kind of bringing everything into one source of truth. That's great in a perfect world, but in the perfect world doesn't always align with, with reality, right? Um, you know, in the real world, we're going to have many sources of truth. Um, you know, we've talked about pulling some, um, you know, making decisions within Teleport from multiple different providers, whether that's our identity provider or Workday or, you know, a CMDB. Um, so it's, it's kind of like gluing all these different external sources of truth together and using that within Teleport to make decisions. Um, and some of that is going to happen externally uh, via Teleport plugin, and some of that is going to happen um, you know, natively within Teleport, hopefully, over time, especially with the predicate. Yeah. Um, that's great. So I think you know, both of you are in engineering. Yep. Um, can you talk, talk about how you work with your partners in security? and how Teleport sort of fits into that? Sure, I mean, you know, we're kind of glued at the hip. Um, you know, this is it's one of those relationships that um, is incredibly valuable. You know, our, our uh, InfoSec team has grown over the years and, you know, encompasses people of many different talents from, you know, um, you know, red team, blue team. You know, we've got lots of different, varied talent on our InfoSec team, and I, I think we, um, we meet with them regularly, um, and you know we solve a lot of problems that, that they want to solve. Um, and conversely, they're actually using Teleport in lots of ways um, for hardened systems that um, we don't even have access to. Um, so it's it's really it's a good relationship. I don't know if anything you want to add to that, Chris? No, I was just going to add that like there's actually people from security that come to us and they're like, hey, can you help us with this thing that we're not going to give you access to? And it's like, <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> because they've, they've found that like teleport's pretty flexible for granting access to one-off things. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we actually use it for a lot of things beyond the large number of systems that are yeah. centrally managed. And do you export your logs to a central like SIM solution in-house? We do. Um, yeah, we do. And, and being able to kind of look at patterns, I, I know there was a chat earlier about exploring patterns in, in your logs and, you know, 
we are every day finding interesting patterns, whether it's user accesses or or just being able to like you know uh, kind of provide tooling so that you know given a user like we can look at like you know. Uh, are they trying to log in with an expired cert? You know, when did they last log in? You know, some, some, what are the roles when they last what log are the in? Roles which is yeah. something I built into. Some tooling uh, that, that Chris had built in, into oh, a reporting tool. A log dashboard, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, you know, those centralized um, you know, logs are, are really helpful um, to, to kind of look at patterns over time, uh, both from like a security auditing perspective and from you know, like an operational perspective. Great. And so what are some other challenges you face as production engineers Outside of Teleport, oh, I, <laughs> I was, I was going to mention uh, you know some problems with, you know some some challenges we're facing with Teleport. Um, just to <laughs> expand on, on that last question, uh, the earlier question, um, you know I think well, one of our big challenges I, I think is observability. Um, you know we're, we're we're constantly talking to Teleport, trying to get more metrics out of the proxies and the auth servers, and make sense of some of those metrics and make sense of some of those logs. Um, but outside of that, I, I think one of the, you know, the bigger challenges for us is, is identifying you know, where problems are and, and also as we go to roll out you know, fixes for problems, how we can do you know, A-B testing, right? When we're dealing with um, you know, the scale that we're dealing with, it's, it's, first of all, it's very hard to test for bugs at that scale. Um, and secondly, like, you know, if we want to roll out a change to a proxy or, or you know, we get a debug build to test some fix to a proxy, how do we roll that out? You know, any, anytime we, we touch a proxy, you know, we're, we're impacting anywhere from 200 to 4,000 sessions. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a real challenge. Uh, how do you think about upgrades then in that case? They're very carefully orchestrated. Um, we get a lot of flack <laughs> anytime we try to do any upgrades. Yeah. That's why patches are painful. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's being transparent with your user community. I think like we've we've gone on a on a rocky road where I think we've earned a lot of trust with them at this point because we do respond quickly to things. We do let them know what's coming. We do explain, okay, we've got to take this down because remember, you've been asking for SFTP for six months. You're finally going to get it. Like, <laughs> let's you know, do this maintenance. Um, but it, the the part where we do run into challenges is, is like Joe said, like. Sometimes you just can't test every scenario when you when you're you've got thousands of, of, of systems and one cluster, um, and but you know rolling upgrades the whole you know I, I don't know like maybe we could find a, a better way of doing this but um, it's, it's always it's, the, the challenge is, is impacting users right no no one you know. Everyone likes to leave, you know, like, likes their long running sessions, right? You know, they've got their, you know, connected box uh, or they're connected to some remote box, TMUX open. You know, they've got a bunch of X11 well, if they were windows. Using TMUX, they'd be less angry. But they've got a bunch of X11 windows open. Yeah, there you you know? go. So, like, the, you're, the second you kill that proxy, you're killing all of that connectivity. Um, and, and people are always unhappy. I mean, we, we try to mitigate it. We provide tons of advanced warning. Um, and we usually tend to. Um, you know, coordinate upgrades with some sort of carrot, like this feature is going to drop, or you're going to get this additional thing. Um, so that's, that's but, but the cool thing usually is now teleport tells them when we haven't upgraded. <laughs> that will be stopped soon. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone knows the V11 came out. <laughs> yeah, I just got that notification this morning. <laughs> Should upgrade the teleport cluster. <laughs> Make sure to message somebody in the teleport help channel. Yeah, we've, we've been getting a lot of uh, comments from our users. Uh, what should I do? Should I upgrade something? You should upgrade your cluster, you know. Um, yeah, there's lots of really interesting feedback from users. On Next that. person that messages me is going to upgrade the cluster. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Here, you have it. So apart from teleport, what other systems uh, do you two manage and maintain? Uh, um, uh, so for me, I mean, I've been a jump for uh, nine years. So I mean, I've touched a lot of various internal systems, um, a lot of infrastructure. Um, you know, we've we've got lots of moving parts and lots of infrastructure, um, lots of automation. So uh, without going into too much detail, um, yeah, I've I've touched a lot of jumps infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, config management, IPAM, yeah. like all the basic stuff. And Joe's also a server hardware whiz. Don't let him undersell <laughs> you. Um, and then, like, recently, I've been doing more cloud stuff, too. So that's been fun. Yeah, nice. So just to close things out, I, was, I have a podcast called Access Control. Everyone should subscribe. And this will probably go up on it. And it's about giving practical tips 
um, for startups in the security and infrastructure realm. So we always like to close out, like, what's one practical tip that you'd like to give to um, the audience here who's in person? Sure. Don't. Can I start? Sorry. Yeah, go for it. Otherwise, I'll forget my train of thought. Thing. <laughs> Don't underestimate your users, right? Like the, the one thing that I can't say enough, whether it's 100 people or 1,000 people moving or 10,000 people moving to use Teleport, try to understand their use cases because there, there was a really great comment this morning. Um, if they don't see their use case, they're just going to work around what you're doing. And I, I think that rings true. Yeah, for sure. Um, for me, I mean, uh, I'm going to give some, some general advice, not necessarily specific to Teleport, but um, invest in hardware keys, you know, YubiKeys, Nitro keys, you know, whatever you want to do. It's, it's incredibly important for your personal self, for your, you know, your company, for your organization. Um, it, we kind of give them out like candy, um, you know, for, for both personal use and, and for professional use. Um, there's a reason they exist, um, and they will protect you from, from ransomware or any other sort of attack that it goes if you implement there. them correctly. If you if implement it correctly. <laughs> and please, please do implement them correctly. correctly. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Uh, thank you to you. So we have about 10 more minutes left. Uh, do we have any audience questions? I think uh, we have to get no, Mike. No, Jay's not allowed to ask yeah, questions. Yeah, no, no Jay. <laughs> You're supposed to be answering our questions. <laughs> you know what? Huh? Yes, it is. Yes. Um, I first want to say thank you both, gentlemen. So I have a question around um, scalability and a specific feature, which is proxy pairing. Are you using proxy pairing today? We're not. <laughs> uh, we're not, but we, we actually hope that's going to solve some, some challenges. So we are having, like I said, we, we, we misuse Teleport regularly. Um, so there is an assumption when you're in IoT mode that that IoT device is going to be able to talk to all the proxies. It's going to just do brute force discovery. Um, we don't expose all our proxies to that IoT device. So that is one thing that we're kind of failing at. Um, well, I mean, it's by design, so we're not failing at that. But when, the, when that discovery mechanism fails, um, we'll often end up with an IoT node that's not connected to you know, the known proxies that we expect it to be connected to. So first of all, understanding that that's actually happened uh, with metrics, and this kind of goes back to observability um, that I mentioned earlier, is tough to do today. Um, so that'll hopefully get better soon. Um, but secondly, proxy peering would solve that problem where if a user in, let's say, you know, New York, that IoT node is not connected to the New York proxy for whatever reason, um, theoretically, from the New York proxy, they would just peer to an adjacent proxy and be able to hit that IoT node. So yes, that's going to solve some problems, hopefully. We're not using it today, but we hope to soon. All right. So if nobody has another question, I do have a follow-up question uh, sure. around etcd. Um, yes. A lot of on-prem customers um, are forced to use this today. Do you sure. have any advice for them on how to set it up and how to use it going forward? Yes, that's a very loaded question. Validate uh, your backups. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. So it's very easy to automate um, snapshot validation. Um, we didn't. We learned the hard way that you should. Um, so we're, we're doing that today. Um, outside of that, I mean, you know, one of the things that that we kind of learned from various etcd outages or you know memory leaks um, is that. You know, generally speaking, if you're, uh, everything is you know, done via GitOps or infrastructure as code, and every other bit of you know, source of truth you need is in IDM, and you don't have any local users, um, that etcd cluster is effectively disposable, assuming that you're either you know, using HSMs or you have your CA um, you know, backup somewhere. Um, you could effectively throw that etcd instance away, bootstrap a brand new one, you know, kind of put the um, keys and values that you need, like your CA. Um, so oftentimes, that's actually a faster path to resolution when etcd is, is screwed up, because it will inevitably get screwed up. Um, I think outside of that, you know, testing etcd at scale, right? Um, ensuring that you know, you're, what you're doing, follow, etcd has a great operations guide um, published online. You know, disk IOPS are hugely important. Network latency is hugely important. Um, pay attention to those things. Those are really important. Don't try and run etcd globally. Um, those are some, you know, lessons that we've learned. Um, yeah. And I, I think, uh, yeah, follow the etcd operations guide. I think it's the best advice I can give you. And don't upgrade them all at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you can do minor upgrades and leave them in inconsistent state. Minor upgrades you can do and leave in, in uh, inconsistent state. Can you talk a little bit about how you use HSMs? Yes. Um, so yeah, so I mean, we obviously we lobbied for the um, HSM uh, feature functionality within Teleport. Um, 
HSM is plugged into the server, Teleport uses them. <laughs> it's that simple, Great. I swear. Um, now, there is some you know, CM migration, but depending on if you're starting with HSMs or not, um, the documentation is really good. Um, test it, obviously, first, please.